I am so glad to be back with you. I look forward to seeing you every year. Don't tell anybody else, but you're my favorite Calvary Chapel. Yeah, okay. So we have such a great service for you today, starting with Rachel Thomas. And I've known Rachel Thomas first as a survivor. And I don't know what the word survivor means to you. It, it conjures up the thought of someone walking away from a crash scene. And then years later, um, seeing them become advocates for seatbelts or something like that. And, and I've watched Rachel become a survivor who makes a difference. I also think of Rachel as, as a daughter, as I learned her story parents, you are going to be impacted. And as a wife, her husband, Lawrence, you've got to go to her webpage, Sowers Education, to get a look at this wonderful man who is co-founder of Sowers Education. She's also a mom, raising her son, balancing life and business and her call and her mission. And she's been a mentor for me, and now I introduce her to you as your mentor. Thank you, thank you. You've been a hero to me for the pioneering work that you're doing in the education field. Um, so I'm so excited to be here. Good morning, almost afternoon. Um, Everybody should be fed and have their coffee. Thank you guys for feeding me. Um, Pastor Brian and Kelly, I'm so appreciative that this is your eighth year doing such an important conference. A lot of times I speak at churches or at community events and people will have their heart touched for a day and then go home and it's back to life as normal. And that's okay because we all have things that we feel passionate about, but if your heart is tugged today, we have amazing organizations out there for you to get to know, to volunteer with, ways to get involved and to really put your feelings into action. So I'm honored to be able to share with you some of my story today. I talk about a lot of different topics in the work that I do, but we have an awesome speaker coming up after me who's gonna share a lot of the facts and statistics. And so I get to focus on giving human trafficking a human face, giving you some insight into how people in our country, how sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, people in the church, people in your community can become affected by this, this crime, this injustice. So a little bit about me. I am from Pasadena, California. Any Pasadena? Woo! Okay. So we have three this service. So you guys are the winners. Uh, wonderful. So Pasadena, beautiful city. I was raised in an upper middle class, two parent, privileged, Christian, all American, ideal family. I mean, um, summer vacations to Europe, never experienced any form of abuse. I was prom queen, really had an all-American, wonderful childhood that any child deserves and dreams of. I worked really hard in school and got into my number one choice, which is Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I went off, my parents sent me, I was 17 years old, explored the city of Atlanta, had a wonderful time in college. And then when I was a junior, I was at a popular college hangout dancing with some friends and a man approached me and he says you are gorgeous has anyone ever told you you should be a model and of course i'm all flattered and it was nice to hear um, but i told him that i had tried modeling in high school i went to some camp and uh, didn't turn into be anything and so i was in school to be a teacher i've always wanted to open a school and i'm almost a senior so thanks but no thanks and then I went back to dancing with my friends. And about 45 minutes later, a girl approaches me and she's around my age, she's beautiful. And she says, you know that guy Mike that came up to you earlier? Um, I'm here with him and we just cannot take our eyes off of you. Can you just come over for a second and, and just talk to us? 
And so they had a booth in the VIP section and I had never been in there before. And so I went and sat with them and Mike handed me his business card. He was wearing a three piece suit. He was well-spoken and polite. And he said he was the number one modeling agent in Atlanta and that he knew talent when he saw it. And he saw talent and potential in me. And he said he wanted to jumpstart my modeling career by investing in my first set of comp cards, which is the model's resume with different looks and height and weight and other numbers on it. And he guaranteed that he would get me my first paid modeling gig within one month. And when he succeeded, I could sign with his agency. And if he happened to fail, then I will have lost nothing because it's all his investment. And the girls he was with were singing his praises and very encouraging and friendly. And so I took that card home and I thought about it and I decided to give him a call. So I called him the next day and he was excited to hear from me and he congratulated me on making a great decision for my future. And we talked about what my major is and what I want for my future and where I was from and had a really cool conversation for almost an hour. And then he says, you know, um, Michelle, the girl you met last night is having a photo shoot next weekend. I think you should just come to that and just jump right in. And so he starts telling me when and where to meet him. And my parents taught me about stranger danger. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not just going to meet you at some random studio. Uh, if I come, I'm going to bring a friend, a male friend with big muscles. And he's like, OK, OK, Miss Paranoid, I don't care. You can bring your grandma if you want to. Um, just come. I'm really excited to test you out as a model. And so that very next weekend, I went to a photo shoot and I brought my friend along with me. And I actually told my parents also where I was going. And I remember getting there and feeling silly that I had been so cautious and, and untrusting. Um, there were professional hair and makeup artists. They had photographers and the backdrop and the lighting equipment and a rack of clothing and a table full of accessories to choose from. And it was a glamorous, America's Next Top Model type experience. And I remember thinking, this is really cool. I didn't know what to make of it, but you know, I just did as they said, and everyone said I did a great job. And so I went home and didn't know what the next step was, but three days later, I got a phone call. Rachel, you are blowing up. I haven't even printed out your comp cards yet. All I did was send the images to some of my colleagues and you already got booked for your first gig. And he told me that there was a music video the following weekend and when and where to come. And he said, if you wanna bring your friend again, I don't care, but you know, I just really wanna work with you. You have a lot of potential. And so the next weekend I did the music video. And at the end of that day, Mike, the agent, comes to me and says, congratulations you have earned $350 for your work today. And it felt more like play than work. And so right there on the set of the music video, I filled out the W-9 that he asked me to fill out in order to receive payment. And on there, I put my full name, my permanent address, which is my parents' home address in Pasadena, my current address where I was living in Atlanta with my roommate, and my social security number, and whatever else that simple one-page tax form asked for. I had filled it out when I worked at the Y and a few other employers. So I filled out this form, handed it to Mike, assumed he would hand it to the casting director and I'd receive a check in the mail. Didn't even think twice about it. Now a few more weeks pass. I've done a few more gigs, gotten to know Mike and some of the other models better, and we're driving in the car to a party and Michelle, one of the girls I had met that first night, was driving. Mike was in the passenger seat, and I'm in the back seat. And a song comes on the radio, and Mike says, I like this, who sings this? And for whatever reason, Michelle didn't respond. I don't know if she was zoned out or the music was too loud, but she didn't respond. And so casually from the back seat, I said, oh, it's Maxwell, it's called Lifetime. And Mike gets so enraged, he reaches over and he slaps Michelle 
And he says, don't you ever effing ignore me. I know you heard me talking to you. And he's hitting her and she's just apologizing and cowering back and still trying to drive with one arm and <clears throat> crying. And in the back seat, I'm stunned because this nice guy just flipped into this monster and oh my gosh, those Lifetime movies are real. And my analysis of the situation was that he's one of those abusive boyfriends and he just hit her, this is domestic violence and she needs to break up with him and I'm gonna get out of here too. And so I went into autopilot, didn't have a nervous breakdown that night, but went home, thought about everything, and then the morning, with the sweetest voice that I could muster up, I called Mike and I said, you know, finals are coming up in school. It's getting really hard for me to juggle school and modeling. Um, I know that you've done a lot for me and, um, you know, I just wanna slow down right now. I'm going to go ahead and focus on school, but I'll keep your number. And if I ever wanna pick back up with the modeling thing, I'll call you. And he was silent for a moment. And then he says, B, I own you. You're gonna do what I tell you to do or somebody's gonna get hurt. And then I heard him ruffle some papers and he read off my parents' home address. And he says, do you understand? And I'm standing there in my living room and like in the movies where it just gets blacker, I was feeling like the world was caving in. I'm silenced. And then he says, when and where to meet him that night. And he says, if you don't come to me, I'm gonna come to you. And then he read off my address and he hung up. And in that moment, I'm thinking, what just happened? Do I call the police and say that this guy just threatened me and I saw him hit his girlfriend last night, but I don't know if I, if I could report that, if they would respond to that. Um, do I call my parents and tell them what happened and hear their disappointment and worry? And I just decided to stay on his good side. I had never heard of human trafficking, never been exposed to how evil people could be. So I figured he's been a nice guy this whole time. He flipped out one night, but let me just do what he asked me to do. That night I met him when and where, he said, and he already had a buyer lined up. He explained to me what I had to do and I started crying. And I said, Mike, please don't make me do this. Please don't. And he just grabbed my arm very tightly and he said, you're gonna do what I tell you to do. Don't make me hurt you. And that night was the first night that I was forced into human trafficking. Just five, six short weeks after being a happy, well-adjusted, high self-esteem, successful college student, a victim of human trafficking. It would be almost a year in this situation, experiencing every form of physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse, every form of hell that you would think of when you think of human trafficking. And I stayed enrolled in school so that my parents didn't, weren't notified that I dropped out. I wasn't going to classes, but I, I kept enrolling. I still kept up with some of my friends and I would only talk to family and friends when I was in a place where I could smile and act happy and make up some fun story for what I had done the weekend before. But after about a year, the police finally got involved because another one of his victims had the courage, despite all the threats and intimidation and abuse to go to the police. And so they started to investigate him. And as it got increasingly more dangerous for me to stay there, I had to go to the only place that I could go, which was home. And so now, two weeks into what was supposed to be my senior year in college, I called home and I said, Mom, Dad, can you guys pick me up at LAX tonight? And my mom, 100% drama queen, her first words were, 
Why? Girl, you better not be pregnant. You are a senior. You just started your senior year. And she demanded to know why I'm coming home. And I said, I'll explain when I get there. Can you just be there to pick me up? And so they came to the airport that night and we rode home in silence. And we got home and sat around the kitchen table in silence. And then my dad broke the ice and he said, you gotta tell us something, what's going on? And so I started to recount how I met a man who said he was a modeling agent and then he flipped and became um, crazy and he forced me to do these things and the places I had been and some of the things I had done and that now he's under investigation and he knows your home address and the police haven't arrested him yet, but I can't go back there and I dropped out of college last year and I'm sorry. And they listened and I told them about 10% of what had really been happening. And I saw my dad hunch over and I saw the tears in my mom's eyes and they just listened. And then when I was quiet, my dad asked one question. He said, did he ever hit you? And by the look in his eyes, I knew that the truth would have broken him and it would have broken his heart to know that his baby girl had been hit. And so I lied and I said, no, he never hit me. And I said, I was really tired and I just wanna to go to bed and ask to be excused. And so they said, okay. And I went to my room and I sat on the bed and wrote out a suicide note, an apology letter to my parents for giving me such a wonderful upbringing, for giving me every opportunity for being so supportive and loving and apologizing that I had wasted everything and put my life in danger and theirs and had become a prostitute. And my plan was to go somewhere the next day and take my life. I didn't want them to find my body on top of everything that I had just put them through. And so I went to bed that night and the next morning they woke me up before I could get up. Thank God I'm not a morning person. He knew how to design me. <laughs> and so they woke me up early they had breakfast prepared and they asked me to just come sit around the table. And I sat there and it was another silent and awkward time. And then my dad asked me to stand up and he just came and put his arms around me. And he said, Rachel, we don't know what you've done. We don't know what you've been through, but we know that there is nothing you could ever do that's so bad that we don't still love you and that God doesn't still love you. And as he stood there and hugged me, then my mom joined in. And it was in those minutes that all the thoughts of suicide left when I believed that I was still lovable. I still had a life worth living. And it sparked just enough of a light inside of me to keep pressing. I still had and have a long road of recovery, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically. There's a lot of recovery, but that was a spark that I needed. So like every survivor, I have a long story to tell that I don't have much longer with you today, but I wanna impress upon you that you as a parent, as a friend, as a church member, as a community member, have a part to play in being that light for someone. Letting people know that they're still lovable, that there's hope for redemption, that you care about justice, that everybody in the world is not a predator and not evil. So as you hear from our next speaker and you get to know some of the organizations in your community to get involved with, I encourage you to please be a voice for the voiceless. And remember that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Thank you.